You've no doubt seen all the news about the thousands of Central American families fleeing violent conditions and making the long, dangerous journey to the U.S. only to be caught by Border Patrol agents, detained, and separated from their children. It's a pretty rough situation to watch unfold. One that's forced a lot of Americans to do some serious soul searching about how far we should go to safeguard our borders and who we should let in or keep out. All this border drama has drawn serious attention to a really small part of America's immigration system that until recently has largely slipped under the radar. The process of seeking asylum. To understand it, you gotta go way back to 1951. That's when the members of the newly formed United Nations, which included the US, drafted an agreement that officially defined a refugee as someone fleeing his or her homeland because of a strong fear of being persecuted based on one of five categories. Race, religion, nationality, political opinion, or membership in a particular social group. Building on the UN agreement, Congress passed the US Refugee Act in 1980, which distinguished asylum seekers from refugees squarely on the basis of where they filed their application. Both classes have to prove that they have a well-founded fear of persecution in their homelands, which means a legit fear of being physically attacked, tortured, detained, or killed. An asylum seeker who arrives at the border can request a credible fear screening at the official point of entry. That's an interview with an immigration agent who decides if the applicant really faces a legit risk of being persecuted or tortured if they're sent back home, as opposed to just, say, seeking better economic opportunities. What the government considers legitimate persecution is also up for debate. Until now, gang violence and domestic abuse fell under the catch-all fifth category that the UN came up with, membership in a particular social group. But Attorney General Jeff Sessions recently announced that those two factors should no longer be considered qualifications for asylum. He basically said that the U.S. can't take in everyone who's having a hard time. America has to draw the line somewhere, and asylum should really be reserved for people facing political or religious persecution, like it was originally intended. I'm Ami Horowitz, and we've been hearing a lot about the migrant caravan in the news. The caravan is a giant group of people that emanated, for the most part, in Honduras and are heading up to the U.S. A lot has been said about this caravan, so I decided to go down, check it out for myself, and figure out what is the reality versus the fiction. Despite the framing of the caravan as being full of women and children, the reality on the ground is quite different. Approximately 90 to 95 percent of the migrants were male. Approximately 90 to 95 percent of the migrants were male. The major narrative being pushed by the press has been that the migrants are leaving Honduras because they are escaping extreme violence and that their lives are under constant threat, setting up the strategy that they would be able to enter the U.S. by asking for asylum. So I started by asking them a simple question. Why are you coming to America? Bueno, voy buscando una mejor vida económica. An asylum seeker who arrives at the border can request a credible fear screening at the official point of entry. That's an interview with an immigration agent who decides if the applicant really faces a legit risk of being persecuted or tortured if they're sent back home as opposed to just, say, seeking better economic opportunities. As opposed to just, say, seeking better economic opportunities. Why are you coming to America? Bueno, voy buscando una mejor vida. Económica. Venir a trabajar aquí a Estados Unidos. Es si podemos trabajar allá porque en Honduras no hay trabajo. Pues buscando una vida mejor porque en Honduras no hay trabajo. Por trabajos. Si vengo a trabajar es porque quiero ir a terminar mis estudios allá. Terminar estudios en mi caso. Come on. Don't you just want to meet Caitlyn Jenner? Ah, ya más mujer. There's a massive logistical effort underway, akin to moving an army, and is clearly costing someone millions of dollars for the transportation, food, water, medicine, and services that are being provided for the members of the caravan. It's a supply chain that is being delivered by an army of trucks, which are all necessary to keep this enormous group moving forward. This is a truck actually carrying generic Gatorade. It's got electrolytes. The Mexican government also seems to be sending police to escort the dozens of buses and trucks that are ferrying the migrants and supplies along the route to the next destination. Ever present among the thousands of migrants are workers of Pueblo Sin Fronteras, 
clad in black t-shirts and colored vests. Pueblo Sin Fronteras means people without borders. They're the ones that seem to be most involved in organizing and mobilizing this caravan. The organization, as the name implies, is looking to create a world without borders, which seems to be one of the reasons why they organized this caravan in the first place, to flout American sovereignty. Many of the Frontera workers have a very interesting perspective on the United States, particularly since they're trying to move all these migrants into our country. Estados Unidos para, para mí ya no es, para mí no es nada, ya pues, porque Estados Unidos ya hay mucho racismo para nosotros de Honduras. Estados Unidos para, para mí ya no es, para mí no es nada, ya pues, porque Estados Unidos ya hay mucho racismo para nosotros de Honduras. This is one of the organizers on the ground with Pueblos Sin Fronteras, and she explains how they help the migrants game the U.S. immigration system. We're working on collaborating with a lot of organizations to do large-scale legal orientations so that people understand their options for refugee and humanitarian protection here in Mexico, as well as their rights to request oh, good. asylum so, no, stay and provide you know, mass presentations about the Know Your Rights, they call them Know Your Rights presentations, like to bring people together and, and make sure they understand that they can organize and they can fight for their rights. Are you helping them on how to, how to speak to new reporters? And uh, training folks and, and how to deal with threats. So like, I was just telling Fox News here, just, like, asking really scary questions. They made a kind of unsafe environment? Well, yeah, of course. How many of you are there? How many of the, from the organization? From, from... Hundreds. I made a call to Maria Ruby from the office of the UN High Commission for Refugees. Maria, now you guys have been on the ground with the refugees from the moment they crossed the border, correct? Yes, that's right. That's right. It's a number of organizations, right? Not just the High Commission for Refugees, but also UNICEF and some other UN organizations that are helping them, correct? Yeah, yeah, that's right. I mean, I can tell you that, uh, for example, in Tapachula, in Chiapas, we were the the only one that is still there. Now here in, in Mexico City, you see more organizations. But yeah, that's right. I and mean, we've been there from the very beginning. Continuing my trip with the migrants, I decided to hop on the back of one of these trucks and hitch a ride with them. So now we're heading to the next location where there'll be food, water, and shelter for everybody. This is one of the many, many trucks and buses that are part of this caravan that are ferrying these guys from one location to another on the way to the United States. At the base camp, there's a mobile hospital stocked with enough pharmaceutical drugs to make Keith Richards blush. There's also plenty of doctors and nurses attending to all the migrants' needs. America also has very generous benefits for people who live in America. Is that something you want to take advantage of as well? Así es. Sí, claro que sí, para para poder salir adelante con por medio de esos beneficios. While it does seem as the majority of these migrants are friendly and simply trying to make a better life for themselves and their families, there's an undeniable element of the migrants who are violent and dangerous. There are probably several billion people in the world who are seeking a better life. Do these migrants think that all of them should be allowed to enter the U.S.? Should America let in anybody who wants to come in? Es la idea y es lo que nosotros queremos. Porque todos venimos con necesidad. Pues la verdad sí. Pues la verdad que sí. Pues claro que sí. Porque va mucha gente necesitada. Y va huyendo por por el motivo de nuestro país. It seems to me that there are leftist organizations that are using these migrants as a tool to push a certain political agenda, which includes the weakening of American sovereignty and our border security. Happy to welcome back here on One America News, Brad Johnson, Americans for Intelligence Reform. Today, I wanted to sit down and talk to you about this caravan of migrants. Now, in your own background uh, as a former CIA officer, you, uh, you spent some time, a lot of time, in Latin America, is that right? That's correct, yes. I'm very familiar with the areas. So based on your knowledge of the area, your own background in the area, stationed there, um, who is behind this caravan and what is the goal? Now, Vice President Pence uh, several days ago announced what he'd learned from the Honduran president, which was that Venezuela is backing a lot of this, a lot of the impetus of this taking place. Now the implications out of what that means are absolutely fantastic. I mean, they're extraordinarily important and dangerous. One, Venezuela, comes from a kind of family now that has been created within Latin America, all the extreme left countries, and certainly including Nicaragua and Cuba and Bolivia and Venezuela. Uh, they're all associated now very closely with Iran. And Iran has uh, officers 
intelligence officers embedded in their military intelligence units and their military units and their intelligence units. So they're, uh, they're funding for all of this. Now we know Venezuela's got economic problems, but their funding is being driven out of, of Iran. So but their funding is being driven out of, of Iran. What he's talking about essentially is an Iranian soft power psychological operation that they're running through Venezuela. This, we've seen similar Iranian operations with Quds Force, uh, at least more uh, in terms of their support for terrorists throughout the region. And more uh, in terms of their support for terrorists throughout the region and other parts of the world. And it's, it's always been a hallmark of Iran, isn't that right, to use this soft power? Absolutely, but I would take it a step further because the doctrine that's being promoted, and this was originally started, oddly enough, by Carlos the Jackal, who now is an old historical figure most people won't be familiar with. But he started a movement that was talking about the uh, linking up of radical Islam and the radical leftist movements within Latin America that they need to join because they have the common enemy of the United States linking up of radical Islam and the radical leftist movements within Latin America that they need to join because they have the common enemy of the United States. Now that has grown and been worked upon and has now become the doctrine of the day for all of those groups and countries. And what they're talking about and their main strategy is to use asymmetrical warfare against the United States to just keep pecking away at the United States and, and chip away and make it a smaller, weaker country at all times. And their main strategy is to use asymmetrical warfare against the United States to just keep pecking away at the United States and, and chip away and make it a smaller, weaker country at all times. And this column, Marching Towards the United States, is a very good example of precisely what that looks like. One of the hallmarks, I think, of asymmetric warfare is the fact that they've been very clear that in every picture, every photo op that you see of them, they're carrying what? They're carrying the Honduran flag. Well, they're funded from different sources, and some of it you see out of the extreme left here in the United States, and there's an association. I mean, everyone, they, you often hear reference, and it was a term used previously, but fellow travelers, and it was a, mm. a term used among us. And it's, it's this socialist international movement and agreement of goals to damage the United States, to reduce its effectiveness on the world stage. And that agreement across the board, it, it creates this fellow traveler syndrome, if you will, where they're all helping and overlapping. And while the extreme left here in the United States supporting these front groups that you've always already mentioned, like Cara and so on. Maria, now you guys have been on the ground with the refugees from the moment they crossed the border, correct? Yes, that's right. That's right. It's a number of organizations, right? Not just the High Commission for Refugees, but also UNICEF and some other UN organizations that are helping them, correct? Yeah, yeah, that's right. The extreme left here in the United States supporting these front groups that you've always already mentioned, like CARA and so on, it's all, that's all overlapped, and it's this big conglomeration of these cooperative groups that share goals. And thankfully, President Trump, at least, I think instinctually kind of understands the threat that it poses and is now pushing forward with policies to shut this down and to combat this instead of just allowing it to happen. Brad, thank you so much for coming on with us today. We're going to be keeping an eye on this and following it as it develops. As As an investigative journalist, I found myself with a few questions about the emergence of fake news. A noted propagandist told me, it's like a movie, he said. 
and it gave me chills at the time. Nearly every scene or image that crosses our path in daily life, he said, was put there for a reason, often by someone who paid a lot of money to place it there. There are two ways to tell that powerful interests might be trying to manipulate your opinion. Number one, when the media seems to be trying to shape or censor facts and opinions rather than report them. Number two, when so many in the media are reporting the same stories, promulgating the same narratives, relying on the same sources, even using the same phrases. The sharing of biased and false, false news has, has become, become all too common, common on, on social, social media. media. More alarming, some media outlets publish and publish the same things that are true without checking facts first. Unfortunately, some members of the media use their platforms to push their own personal bias and agenda to control exactly what people think. And this is extremely dangerous to our democracy. 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 I mean, think of it, there are literally thousands of legitimate news stories that could be reported in a given day and an infinite number of ways to report them. When everybody's on the same page, it might be the result of an organized campaign. 